It's time to talk about Intel's new 12th gen CPUs and the performance, but make sure you actually watch the video to understand the context of what I'm trying to say at this video and not just look at the video title. We decided that we wanted to cover the 12900K only in this video. The reason why is because the 11900K was a bit of a disappointment. We didn't even bother reviewing it because it just wasn't that interesting. And I wanted to see if Intel's new older lake architecture brought anything new to the table. Intel's taken a bit of a different approach to this new architecture of these new chips and this whole new platform by focusing less on raw performance, but more on CPU cores that are optimized for certain tasks. Kind of like how Apple is doing it with their Apple Silicon. The task that we're gonna be focusing on in this video is gaming. Content creation and productivity based content will come a bit later when we have a bit more time with this CPU and these CPUs. I've got no idea about the availability at this point in time given it's pre-launch, but I think the 12900K is going to be a popular chip for the high end, so I wanted to see what that looked like. The main thing I was interested in though was I wanted to see what would happen if we paired the 12900K with two powerful GPU options the 6800 XT and the RTX 3080 Ti, and see if there's any performance left on the table at all. Spoiler alert, this is not what you're expecting from Intel at all. Let's start off by getting the biggest thing out of the way with the 12900K, the price. The Intel Core i9 12900K comes in at around 1,100 Australian dollars. I reached out to Intel for comment on the US price, but yeah, they haven't got back to me at the time of filming this, so. I guess I'll put it on screen right now so you guys all know, but yeah, you know, you, you already know the pricing if you're watching this part of the video. As far as our testing configuration, we built three test benches up, and let me just say that there were lots of different BIOS versions going around for these Z690 boards. We decided that after a certain cutoff date that we would keep the latest BIOS as of that date, which was Monday the 1st of November 2021. We used our regular GPU test bench for our 11th and 10th gen testing, with the OS being freshly installed with Windows 11 Enterprise for every subsequent CPU change. Our Ryzen test bench was set up in a similar fashion, and our 12th gen setup is also set up the same way too. There are a few other things that we did too, so we use one specific kit of RAM for all the CPU-based testing on platforms that only have DDR4 support. We use the kit of G-Skill Triton Z Royal at 5333 megahertz. We set that to 5200 megahertz to match our DDR5 RAM kit speed. We went with the new Kingston Fury Beast DDR5 kit at 5200 megahertz, with 32 gigs of that at least. And we didn't overclock the chips at all because we wanted to see the pure out of the box figures. All the other figures from the other CPUs we tested are also the out of the box stuff as well. We have a lot more detailed content around DDR4 and DDR5 comparisons, also some more tech technical deep dives about the architecture, and we'll scratch on a little bit of that here, and we're also gonna do lots of builds as well, so stay tuned for that. So make sure you check out our first 12th gen build after this too, there'll be a link in the description if you wanna see that. Okay, I decided not to include 12600K results in this video for two reasons. The first reason is time. To test what we did took about three days, and some of the benchmarks lock you out for 24 hours if you run them too many times with different hardware combinations. This actually happened to us as we were just about finishing, so we couldn't complete all of our testing. We don't have 10 staff members to sit around benchmarking all day. I hope you guys appreciate all of the hard work and the sleepless nights that we put into this single video on its own. We did test other stuff that's not gonna be in this video, so you know, take that with a bit of grain of salt. Now that all of our excuses are out of the way, let's get into it. Wow, that was a lot of preamble stuff to pre-qualify what we're trying to do here, Claire. Let's start off with what everybody wants to know about, Cinebench performance. We tested with Cinebench R23 only. We've got some historical data with Cinebench R23 that we've collected that we've used for comparisons from the past, from testing stuff before, and all of these chips are chips that we have on hand or chips that we've had in the past. If we don't have results for your chip, we just don't have one. So let's see what happened. From our multi-threaded testing in Cinebench R23, it's immediately clear that the 12900K is an interesting animal. In multi-threaded workloads, it comes pretty close to the 5950X, which uses traditional cores and a threaded architecture, with all cores being more or less created equally. Just for reference as well, the multi-core multiplier reported by Cinebench for the 12900K was reported at being 13.9 times. Let's move on to single-threaded performance. This is where the 12 
12900K really comes into its own. It completely blows the door off all of the other CPUs that we've ever tested. It's 291 points higher than the 11900K and 341 points higher than the 5950X. This is a truly impressive result. And it just goes to show that when Intel actually cares about changing its architecture and lithography and not rehashing the same old processes over and over, that they can actually regain a lot of performance that was being left on the table. Here's a benchmark that we usually throw in as a bit of a precursor to our Linux specific content, which will be coming later. The timed Linux kernel compile benchmark. We ran this one as a bit of a hint as to what's coming with Linux performance. This test is run with an older kernel version to test as a majority of the CPUs that we've tested have also been tested with compiling this kernel version and we'll be retesting this over the next few months or so with a newer kernel but you know this is what 5.4 looks like. Okay so the 12900k for multi-thread workloads and single core workloads is impressive but what about what this chip is actually really designed for? Gaming and that's why you're all here, right? Like I mentioned in the intro, the real point of this video is to see how the CPU is for gaming based benchmarks. We decided what better way to test that than to run all of the benchmarks we usually do with our regular GPU videos and add some new ones that are also directly compare the performance with the i9-10900K, the 11900K, the AMD Ryzen 9 5900X and the 5950X, a five way CPU shootout with two different GPUs. We ran five different benchmarks that all use the GPU and CPU in different ways to see what the performance looks like in different situations. Stuff like resizable bar was disabled for all three test benches to even out the parameters since resizable bar at the time of filming on Intel's 12th gen platform reduces the performance by about 10 to 15%. We also did fresh Windows 11 installs on the test benches between CPU changes to make sure we weren't being impacted by the Windows 11 level three cache bug. With that said, let's start off with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. This benchmark is built into the game and gives us a good indication of how the game will perform on your system. From the absolutely crazy amount of testing we've done with this benchmark, we know that it's highly influenced by the CPU. And you can pause that video that you're watching right now for a little bit longer to take a look at these graphs for a bit longer if that's what you want, but let's see what happened. What really surprised me here was how good the 6800 XT is with fast CPUs. With both the 3080 Ti and the 6800 XT, we saw a 50 plus FPS difference between the Ryzen chips and the 12900K and the previous two generation chips, if that makes sense. Now, I retested this so many times and I kept getting these results. It's astonishing how big these gaps are at 1080p. At 1440p, we're seeing a lot of the 1080p results being echoed. As these CPUs get faster and the GPUs get faster, we're seeing 1440p in some testing become far more CPU bound. And again, I'm surprised by how well the 6800 XT completely demolishes this benchmark. At 4K, it's a little bit of a different story though. We hit that hard GPU ceiling and the results across the board start to even out across all the CPUs. Let's move on to Unigen Superposition. For the Superposition test, we perform three regular tests that we do in all of our videos with GPUs. 4K Optimize, a custom 1440p preset and 1080p Extreme. Immediately, we can see that those same results are being echoed with superposition as well at 1080p extreme, those being the 4K ones that we saw on the last benchmark. It's highly GPU bound and we're hitting that hard ceiling, but at 1440p, we start to see the 12900K shine once more.
At 4K, we're hitting that ceiling again with being GPU bound, but the 12900K still performs as expected. Next up is Basemark GPU. Now Basemark gives us a great indication of Vulkan performance in both Windows and Linux, and we'll be covering that Linux side of the stuff in another video. The great thing about Basemark is it's really good at exposing weaknesses in both CPUs and GPUs. This is why we always use it. As expected, the 12900K at 1080p with the 3080 Ti is out on top. The main thing here with these results is the FPS numbers are quite high. However, because they're all high for all the CPUs, the percentage difference is quite small between all of the CPUs. With the 6800 XT and actually most AMD GPUs in Basemark, it shows clear weaknesses with CPUs and GPUs. Surprisingly, the 11900K came out on top, but take this result with a grain of salt. Because at 1440p with the 3080 Ti, the 5950X is out on top by two frames, which at these high FPS numbers is within a margin of error. However, again with the 6800 XT and the 12900K, the results that we're seeing is the 11900K comes out on top again, even the 10900K beats it. So, you know, Basemark exposing weaknesses since way back. Lastly, at 4K, the 12900K and 5950X are equal in performance with the 3080 Ti. However, with the 6800 XT, we're seeing the same thing with the 12900K sitting in the middle of the field. I wanted to change this up by running some benchmarks for a title that is highly optimized for AMD CPUs and GPUs. Dirt 5. Now, I was curious to see if those game engine optimizations actually equaled more performance or if it was just a bunch of marketing fluff. Let's see what happened. Let's start off at 1080p. First off the bat, we're seeing the 5950X is the fastest CPU paired with the 3080 Ti and the lead here over the uh, 10th and 11th gen CPUs is pretty huge. However, with the 6800 XT, the results are inverted with the 12900K coming in at last position and the 11900K being the fastest. This is such an odd result and I tested this so many times and I've kept giving the same results. It, it's quite bizarre. At 1440p with the 3080 Ti, the 12900K is an equal last spot with the 5900X. And again, the 11900K is out on top by six frames. However, with the 6800 XT, the result is completely inverted with the 12900K coming in equal first position with the 10900K. It's benchmarks all over the place. Lastly at 4K with the 3080 Ti and the 12900K, it's sitting right in the middle of the field and with the 6800 XT, the 11900K is out on top once again, but only by a single frame. And the 12900K, the 10900K, and the 5950X share the same 103 FPS score. For the last set of benchmarks, we use Horizon Zero Dawn. This is a pretty popular one to test with since like Basemark, it can expose both strengths and weaknesses. At 1080p in Horizon Zero Dawn, the 12900K with both the 3080 Ti and 6800XT comes out on top. The gap between the 10900K and 11900K with both of these GPUs is huge. As a bit of a spoiler, the 12900K comes out on top on all of the Horizon Zero Dawn benchmarks, but by how much is where this gets interesting. Moving on to 1440p, we're seeing the same gaps being echoed that we saw with the 12900K completely demolishing its previous generation counterparts. Bye bye 11900K and 10900K. Lastly, at 4K with the 3080 Ti, we're seeing that with all CPUs, it's hitting that GPU bound performance ceiling coming in at just a single frame above the other CPUs in the field. The 6800 XT has a more of a pronounced margin, but again, we're hitting that hard limit with being GPU bound. One thing that I wanna come back with with all of these tests is how DDR4 impacts the performance, as I already mentioned earlier in the video, but we didn't have enough time to do any of it. That's you know, just how it is when you are really strapped for time working on other content and this really important stuff. But we can draw a few conclusions for the Intel Core i9-12900K. One conclusion is that the performance for gaming performance is quite competitive to a degree. 
this is bleeding edge tech we're seeing. And in terms of the technology that's been built with these new older lag chips, time will tell if this actually makes a huge difference at all. Another conclusion is that the platform in which you're investing in, if you're going down the path of building yourself a new older lag based system, has a few entry points. The cheaper DDR4 route for people who are upgrading and not building new with existing memory. And then there's the people who are building new who want the latest and the greatest. There are a few things that don't quite work yet, like resizable bar, but I guess as usual with any emerging technology like DDR5 and PCIe 5.0 and all those bells and whistles that come along with new platforms, you'll be paying that early adopters tax here. Not only that, DDR5 memory, as far as I know, is in very limited supply. For us personally, it was near impossible to get any memory from any companies for the launch, obviously with the exceptions of a few. That, and the price of DDR5 is going to be ridiculous. That's not the whole story though. The motherboards are expensive too, and I'm talking like TRX40 expensive. They're very, very expensive. The final conclusion is that the value proposition between say the 5950X, the 11900K and the 12900K, if you were just looking at the chips and not the motherboards and memory and all that jazz, the 12900K in Australia is at least 50 to $100 cheaper than the 5950X, which I'm guessing AMD is gonna see this and this is probably gonna change, but as far as we tested, it's almost crazy to say this but the 12900K is better value right now. If you could actually buy one at launch, which we don't know yet. As far as people who invested in the 11900K or just Rocket Lake in general, uh, with probably the shortest CPU lifespan we've ever seen, I feel bad for you because for about a hundred bucks more, you can have something that is leaps and bounds better. I, I don't know, 11th gen was just the most confusing mess ever. Now it's actually hard for me to come to a proper conclusion because this is the launch of a new CPU, but not just that, it's a new platform, a new architecture. Usually we see iterative changes, but because of the introduction of new memory, it changes almost all of the parameters. It's almost like we're beta testers for this new platform. The amount of BIOS updates that were issued was just crazy. And to be honest, it was hard to keep up with. Overall, from what I've tested with the 12900K, I'm, I gotta say, I'm impressed that Intel has finally made a CPU that's worth talking about. And it looks to be priced quite competitively given that the market right now is all over the place with pricing and availability. Now, I, I feel like for the first time in a long time since Ryzen's launch that Intel is actually confident with their own product. Uh, I, I guess time will tell. Now, AMD has held off Intel for a while but it looks like Intel might be making a bit of a comeback. That is at least until Zen 4. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. If you hated the video, hit the dislike button twice. Once again, thank you so very much for watching. I'm your boy Nick with Gear Seekers. You peak, we seek. I've been uh, drinking this coffee off screen the whole time. It's probably cold. Yep, it's cold. <laughs> It's actually cold. <laughs> mm. From hot coffee to iced coffee.